Steel Battalion, the most infamous game on the big green. And for good reason. I mean, it's that massive controller. Have you seen it? It's crazy. I mean, look at this thing. It's just... It's, oof. Uh, speaking of which, I guess I need to assemble this for the video. So, while I do that, I think we could do some history about this fabled game. At the 2005 Game Developers Conference, Atsushi Inaba, the producer of the game, stated that he and his team, comprised of Capcom Production Studio 4 and former members of Human Entertainment, aka the Clock Tower guys, wanted to make a game that used a new type of peripheral that had never been used before, with the prototype being developed for the PlayStation 2. When the Xbox came into the picture though, Anaba and his crew decided that the more powerful console would be a better home for the game. Speaking of peripheral, here's the controller. I mean, it's crazy. Consisting of 40 buttons, two flight sticks, and three pedals. I mean, this mammoth beast is made specifically for Steel Battalion alone and is required to play it. The crazy thing is that each button on this controller has a purpose from communications, to weapon select, to reloading, to washing the windows. And here you have it, Steel Battalion. I mean, yeah, this game is this game is nuts. Of course it is. It came with a manual that uh, makes you feel like you bought a mech at Best Buy or something. Of course, this is a reprint that I put in a nice little convenient folder. But, uh, oh boy. I'm, uh, I'm gonna have to learn how to pilot this thing, so while I'm doing that, why don't we go ahead and start talking about the story of the game like we usually do, and uh, we'll catch up from there. So yeah, go on ahead. I'll uh, be reading this. God, this thing reads like stereo instructions. Leek. Steel Battalion's plot isn't much different from other mech action games out there. It's the future, 2080 AD to be precise, and the world is at war. As the instruction manual states, the US military isn't as powerful as it once was, alliances begin to crumble, and new nations arise. You play as a newly recruited pilot of the 7th Special Panzer Division, the best vertical tank division of the Pacific Rim Organization, which is a coalition of numerous countries. You're preparing to receive extensive training in operating a VT when your base is attacked. Having to learn on the fly, you'll take on a series of missions taking on the forces of Hai Shi Dao, a man-made island and major trading center that declared independence from the PRO and waged attacks on their locations. That's pretty much it. Though, I have to admit, I never expected a game like this to have this huge plot with twists and turns and major character development. but. Again, that's not what attracted me to this game when it first came out. It was more or less the thought of, how am I going to play this with this huge controller? The answer to that is quite simple. Like games of its type, leaning more on Armored Core as an example, you progress through a series of missions in your VT, customizing your layout and supplies, as well as choosing newer generations of VTs when they become available for spares being purchasable with supply and battle points that you earn for defeating enemies. And just like Armored Core, you have to choose wisely so you don't go overweight capacity. The more battle points you earn, the more advanced VTs you can pilot. Pretty much like any mech game. But let's finally talk about that mechanical elephant in the room, the controller. As I stated earlier, there are two sticks, one for controlling your aim and the other for turning your vertical tank three pedals for acceleration, braking, and a sidestep dash, and 40 buttons, each having a purpose. There's buttons for opening and closing the hatch, controlling your map and radar, weapon selection, reloading, dumping fuel tanks, washing your window, extinguishing cockpit fires, night vision modes, communications with home base and other pilots, hell, you can't even start up the mech until you flip the startup switches and press the ignition. And of course, there's the emergency eject button. When your VT has taken too much damage and is on the verge of blowing up, you must eject from the VT in time. Otherwise, it's game over. For real. I mean, you have to start over. You lose your save file. You can also game over by running out of funds to buy a new VT if yours gets destroyed. I can't lie to you. 
This game is tough as hell. You will fail missions quite a bit until you adapt and figure out how to take out your enemies swiftly and with precision. And of course, reading the damn handbook. That thing actually matters. Thankfully, the controller is fun as hell to play with. Even if it can seem a little intimidating at first with all the buttons and such to learn. But once you get the hang of it, you really feel like you're controlling a giant walking mech. Going into battle, making sure not to turn too sharply or go too fast to avoid tipping over, checking your ammo and fuel, keeping in contact with your team. It truly is an experience. However, when you take away this controller, well, you just have a very standard mech game that doesn't really stand out from other mech games of the time. Which isn't to say that it's bad. Far from it. Although, I have to admit the AI could use some work as your teammates are not the best at their job sometimes. But let's face it, you're going to play this game for the gimmick that is the controller. One thing that is nice is that you can replay any mission you've unlocked in the story, or try to beat the game in higher difficulties. But other than a few unlockable modes and bonuses, there's not much else to this game. Visually, Steel Battalion is a very dark game, and not in the brightness department. Don't get me wrong, the graphics are really nice with detailed machines and average looking stages. Everything is just a shade of muddy brown and green seen through the view of your cockpit. But in a game that takes place in the midst of a giant war, this color scheme fits perfectly. Speaking of the cockpit, seeing the different numbers, bars, stats, and screens that react with the buttons on the controller fits great with the experience. I can see why Capcom felt that only the big green could handle this game. Audio-wise, the game sounds wonderful with sound effects that help immerse you in the experience, while the music is very military-influenced. Though you can purchase a boombox for your VT to hear different soundtracks. Sadly though, there's no option for custom music. As for voiceover, there isn't much there, besides on some cutscenes and when you're communicating with your higher-ups or other teammates. But what's here is okay enough. Before I get to my final thoughts on Steel Battalion and the end of this episode, I wanted to briefly touch upon Steel Battalion Line of Contact, the online-only sequel that came out February 27th, 2004, again Xbox exclusive. Essentially what would have been the online portion of Steel Battalion, ten players in two teams of five would compete against each other in Conquest, Capture the Flag, and Battle Royale modes as well as a campaign mode where you would choose a faction to play as and try to take as much land on the island you play on. Sadly though, due to Live being dead on the big green, Capcom axed the online modes not too long after Line of Contact was released. Though from what I've heard, there is a decently sized following on X-Link. And now, the $300 question. Is the legendary Steel Battalion worth it? That answer depends entirely on you. Are you a fan of mech games? Then, yeah, it's worth every penny. Having the experience to control a mech in your room is one of a kind. I mean, hell, there's a guy out there that built his own custom casing to make it feel even more immersive, complete with a two-way phone to make it co-op. However, as stated earlier, you take away that controller and Steel Battalion is just an average game, making it even more apparent when you look at the 360 sequel that I didn't even have a controller, it was just a regular controller and connect, and look how well that did. Regardless, without that controller, it makes it hard to recommend to anyone else, especially with copies of the game, controller included, ranging from two to three hundred dollars, and that's just loose without the box, making this the most expensive Xbox game to collect for. Hell, I never thought I'd even own this thing if it wasn't for the old MT crew chipping in together and surprising me with it when we all met at SGC years ago. I will say this though, if you have a chance to, either via a friend owning it or 
you're lucky and your local game shop has it set up, give Steel Battalion a try and see for yourself if it's worth taking the plunge. So there we have it, Steel Battalion and it's sort of maybe not sequel but really an expansion to Steel Battalion. And with that, this is the 100th episode in the bag of uh, Reading Flashback and I have to say, I didn't think I'd make it this far, mostly because, you know, when you're collecting for retro games and stuff or older systems, it's either Nintendo, Sega, or in most cases, Sony. Microsoft's really not brought up much in the collecting circle, and I honestly thought that doing a show strictly devoted to Xbox wasn't going to catch on, but I did it because I loved it. and. <laughs> Needless to say, you guys have proven that, proven that otherwise. It's, it's been tremendous this journey, and I couldn't have done it without you. So, really, this is a big thank you from the bottom of my heart. All you ladies and gentlemen out there who watch the show, comment, uh, message me on social media, things like that, that have come to the streams, just, just overall, just hung out and enjoyed what I did. It, I just I have no words except thank you so much and it means a lot that we that we got this far and I'm still gonna keep going and this this big green train ain't stopping for nothing nah, so here's to re flashback episode 200 uh, hopefully it won't take six years to get there but we'll see so with that as always, this is the Dolly Popka saying, if you want to play retro, go and stay always green, my friends. I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode and want more of me and the Big Green, then click that subscribe button and the bell to get notified when new content arrives. I want to say a special thank you to my patrons for helping not just the channel grow, but me as a creator. You have my forever thanks. If you're interested in the channel and would like to help it grow further, consider becoming a patron today. For the cost of a soda or an item on the dollar menu, you can help myself and the channel provide the best source of big green programming and more. Once again, all the thanks and love.